Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order of the Cincinnati Board of Park Commissioners. It's March the 16th. And with me today, we have Linda Thomas, our Commissioner, Vice President, and Commissioner North and Commissioner Lindner. And joining us uh, remotely is Commissioner Castellini. So we are uh, in full attendance. And today, since Commissioner Castellini is off site. We'll do roll call votes um, for, for our, that purpose. Our first agenda is public comments. We have one. <clears throat> so we'll turn the, the floor over for two minutes to Cynthia Duvall. Thank you, Cynthia. Welcome. Good morning. Um, I know last time I was up here, up here, I spoke to you about the safety of the stairs in Burnett Woods. So on this episode of What is Broken in Burnett Woods, I bring to you the little plastic entrance that currently provides blockage to traffic out in front of uh, Trailside Nature Center. I know Joel has seen it, I've talked to him about it. I know at least four of the commissioners sitting in front of me have seen it up close and personal. I know the director has seen it. And what it is, is it's a plastic that's been used for the last five years to keep cars from driving through to Trailside Nature Center. Um, it blows over regularly. I've put it back myself many, many, many times. Um, when it is blown over, it blows into walkways, it blows into the roadway, it doesn't provide any stoppage for traffic. On one side of the barrier, it says road closed. On the other side, it says park closed. So if it's not put back correctly, it looks like the park is actually closed. Um, it's a little ridiculous at this point that this is the barrier that we're preventing to keep the children that play at the summer camp on the asphalt in front of Trailside Nature Center. We're using this little barrier to keep them safe. Uh, it's a high pedestrian area in front of Trailside Nature Center. You're using this little plastic barrier to keep people safe that is inconsistent, ugly, and quite frankly, should have been fixed a really long time ago. This is a safety priority for the park. It's been on the list. The Plaza Rehab has been on the 2007 Master Plan. It was a topic of discussion before that. It's been a topic many times. It's widely supported by the community, and I can't seem to get it on your radar. So since the word plaintiff tends to get on your radar, I have pictures of as many times as this is blown over and I've fixed it. I'm happy to provide them to anybody that becomes injured as a result of the negligence of this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duvall. And um, it's a good thing we have additional ballards that are in place along that um, drive on uh, Brookline Drive. So uh, thank you for your, your comment and your input. Uh, we also received some input from, uh, from citizens about the urban forestry assessment that has been uh, deferred to, uh, to another committee. We also have comments about amenities at Smail Park and we continue to receive public input and public comments on the Burnett Woods Dog Park. And we appreciate all the input that we continue to receive on the dog park. So thank you. With that, we'll move into approval of minutes. We have two sets of minutes. Uh, let's take them together first, February 16th minutes. Uh, are there any additions, corrections to the February 16th minutes as provided? How about on March 7th? We have minutes from our special meeting held on March 7th that have been distributed in our packet. Any adjustments, corrections to those? I have none. If not, I will uh, entertain a motion for approval of both sets of minutes. So moved. And second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Tia, would you call the roll, please? Yes. yes. Vice President Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Castellini? Yes. Commissioner Lindner? Yes. Commissioner North? Yes. Thank you. Next, we'll move into the next thing. Uh, Jason, would you like to introduce Mr. Gross? Yes. So next up is our plan design update. Cool. Cool. We're supposed to sit here now? Yes. You're you're part of, you're 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 part of the meeting. You're not, uh, <laughs> and it's easier for the for us to, to hear for those listening to hear on the the microphone there. So 
Welcome, sir. Good morning, commissioners. How are all of you today? Good, Good thank you. Good. Um, I don't believe I have any asks today as far as um, requirements for funding, just some updates on some things that are going through right now and feel free to stop me at any time and ask any questions that you may have. Um, first thing I wanna tell you is we're excited to let you know that we've added an engineering technician to our team, long overdue. He's actually here today, his name is Matt Schiller. Matt? Matt, welcome. Well. Thank you. Happy to help him. Nice to have you. Absolutely. We, Matt uh, knows a lot about surveying. He brings a different skill set to our team that we haven't had before. So we're excited to get him implemented into some projects. He's already making progress. So happy to have him. Also excited to uh, let you all know that we have four or five really good candidates for engineering intern, the other engineering position that we've had open for quite some time. So Jenny and Jason has worked with, along with Eric to fill that down and we're probably gonna start interviewing those in the next month. Hopefully we get some good fits for our team. And also um, we are interviewing three co-op students next week. Um, we're time to turn over that, get a new co-op for this semester. So we are interviewing a few of those next week with a focus hopefully on landscape architecture. That's one discipline we don't really have, you know, as a skill set inside mm -hmm. of our house and getting that perspective will really help round out the team. So how, how long will that term be for a co-op? Typically they, this one would be all the way through the end of the summer. Okay. We can elect to keep them in the same capacity as we do a seasonal employee. We actually have one right now that we'd love to keep and turn into a real full-time employee. So uh, we're finding some great kids and uh, happy to uh, be a part of that program for sure. Nice. So do you all have any questions about staff or anything you want to add? Uh, if not, I'll move. Thank, thank Derek for his help and uh, getting. Uh, he's uh, running a tight ship over there and he's got a whole lot on his plate. So we really do appreciate everything he's doing to help us. I send him email after email and he always answers the bill. So I appreciate it. Um, current construction projects. Um, as you all saw on the February, on the March 7th meeting, you approved the Alm Sanitary Sewer. We have that in progress, certification of funds. Queen City Mechanical has already been alerted that they've got the project. We're walking through pre-construction steps right now. We anticipate that to go this spring as soon as possible. Um, Alt Park, a quick update. As I reported last time, the phase one pavilion roof repairs were completed we have additional funds already set up in this year to continue that into the second phase. $87,500 was set aside under fund 222014. Uh, Chris McGee is running that project right now with Andrew Campbell looking into the best way to use that restoratively. I know that what they did last time really made a huge difference and I can't wait to see this summer how much better it is inside of that facility because of those improvements. So we're happy to continue that work. Uh, Burnett Woods, we are removing two swing sets as we've talked about before, one close to the Millionaires Club and one down below Trailside Nature Center that's in the path of some of the sinkholes that are happening because of the uh, MSD line down in that area right now. So we are, we do have a contract for that. Funds are certified and we're essentially waiting on Bruce to come and do that work. We expect it in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Lytle Park renovation, all good news there. Everything is moving forward. We had a really positive uh, meeting with Western and Southern. We walked through the site and I got to see a whole lot of the things that are going on. Chris McGee is running that project. Things are going really, really well. We moved the Abraham Lincoln statue on February 8th without a hitch. They moved it early in the day because they had some wind concerns, so we didn't want to wait. Um, but all that went really, really well. Abe is in place in the correct place. Um, we're working through some additional work, as I mentioned to you all last time, initially the lights along 4th Street were not energized under the current designs. So we've been working with DOTE and Western and Southern on some 4th Street improvements there. Um, still working through the quotes for that, value engineering some things out. Uh, we've been back to Bruce once to ask for explanation on some of the costs and we will present that to you all for any ask for money next time. We anticipate that we will ask for a part of use of some of the contingency, but we'll have partnerships with potentially both Western and Southern and certainly DOTE will be paying for some of this as well because they've requested some of these things. So we'll bring that to you when we have a more concrete idea of exactly what's going on. And we expect that to be in April. And this was pretty exciting because this is something that was taken out of the project in order to, to keep the project. I mean, obviously the cost escalated, so it was removed from the project. And now that we're digging into it, it's like, well, wait a second, it makes sense to just go ahead and, and correct the sidewalk, do the lights right. Um, I believe the original scope was to energize the four lights that were existing when the project started. 
And now we're starting to look at what are the possibilities to maybe do six lights that would kind of mirror the lights on the other side of the street and have the, his, like, the historic character. And so uh, what Joel's team's done is, as you can see on the drawing that's up right now, is this is, that's all, it's at, I guess it would be five. The blue dots are the lights, five lights, um, <coughs> including this bump out, which would then align the crosswalks to make a lot more sense. I talk a lot about how proud I am that Joel's brought um, accessibility to the forefront with this, which is not just to do the sidewalk as it exists, but to say, how can we make the sidewalk better? How can we make it more accessible? Because that's a weird turn there. You want to make it line up and the crosswalks make a little bit more sense. And that's what this bump out will do. So we're at the point now where we're talking both to DOTE, Western and Southern, and then obviously, you know, what, what is the cost share for that? And is it a project that all three groups want to support and move forward with? So that's that support we're going back with as we try to negotiate the best deal. So there's potential that for the actual sidewalk itself, that Correct. we might get it, to redo the sidewalk so that that's new as well, to do um, additional lights and to make kind of like to fit that piece. The scope was just kind of part in, mm -hmm. and that was removed from the scope. And now we look at it and say, while well, we're at it, does it make sense to just go ahead and, and pinch up this wire to the city? And so that's the so we're trying to negotiate if we should actually include that. But we think that any additional funding requests would all be within the contingency budget. So uh, that's the piece we're still continuing, and we'll go back with more details later. We've asked that they break this down on kind of responsibility as much as possible. So DOTE for exactly like what Jason said, they want to add five additional lights to kind of round out that you know, historic avenue all the way up to the Taft. If they want to add those, we've asked that they broke out those additional things beyond what we would have had to do to make essentially the energization of the original lights whole. We've asked them to break that out so it's easy for you all to see, you know, the differences, the amenity, the, the change order things that we should have had to do an obligation versus the amenity that we're adding to the park. That should help, you know, with the fundraising effort or the fund div division efforts. So, Can any I questions one, online? Yes, yeah, I have one, one question. I, um, you all have an option two and an option one. Which option? Yes, ma'am. Initially, initially, Mrs. Castellini, there were two options exactly like shown. Um, March 10th, we got even a third. We had asked them to break this out. What would the parks have had to do just to re-energize those lights? That was essentially what you're seeing under option one. What sidewalk would have had to have been broken out? What conduits would have had to been put in? What electric would have had to have been put in to re-energize those lights up to the standard that we would have had to do anyway? DOTE is asking that we add some more lights, add back in the fourth street bump out. That is the option two, which is more the Cadillac quote unquote option that gets the more um, robust curb, the additional five lights, all of the historic lights, that is where we're breaking down those costs right now. And I even have one, since the board report was repaired, I have a refined breakdown of those costs. And that's what we're working through right now to bring so, to you when we know exactly what DOTE's part would be, what you know Cincinnati Park Board part would be, and what Western and Southern may potentially be willing to pay for just to upgrade that corridor as a part of everything else. So that's gotcha. where we are in the process right now. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Welcome. I, I think you're absolutely right to, to be doing this all at the same time. We have, we'll have a beautiful new park. And uh, if if we can make sure that the surrounding area is, is as well, complementing that is great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, a small one, but uh, it's been a long in the making. Oldham View Park is set to receive removable bollards. For some reason, we've had several issues even since I've been here. People running down the stairs in their vehicles. I, I kind of understand at the 90 degree, but once you make the corner, that the second one is the most impressive one. So if you can make that corner and turn that fast, I don't know how many beers you drink to do that. But in any case, uh, Matt Hood and I have looked at There's been two people run down the stairs, not just the one in the 90 degree, Commissioner, the one, the second one closer into the, I don't know what that building, the river. It's a huge apartment building right there. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. The, the, Farther one, once you've already made the curve, they've run down those stairs. So, this is next to the incline. yes. Yeah. Well, I think, are the accidents question mark? Uh, or are they intentional? I mean, I think that's what nobody knows for sure. It certainly is an accident once their car is down there, but yeah. I know it's bizarre. a great view. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yes. So, Alita is doing that work under their uh, pavement restoration term contract already have a DO for that, essentially just waiting to schedule the work. That should happen this spring. Um, the last one I had, 
Under current construction focus was water nursery. That work began on March 6th. That was to repair the concrete in front of the garage and create the pad for the um, dumpsters outside of the gate. That work is almost 100% complete. Andy told me yesterday that all it remains is site restoration. So we should be wrapping that project up, finishing it in the next month or so. We should have a completion report for you next month. Um, one that I want to mention that's inside of the current division focus, but want to highlight is Inwood Park's drainage repair. That project is also almost complete. They fixed the pipe uh, a week ago. We know that the head pressure on top of the concrete uh, liner is causing some residual leaking. I want to make sure that that's not the case before I let them close all that back up. So we're going to drain everything once the, the pond and the pipe is uh, back in play so that I can see everything before we cover everything up and I don't have that opportunity again. That makes any sense. So that work is almost done. Um, just checking things to make sure we don't have a bigger problem. We think alleviating that, it's, that was the whole point of the project is we couldn't drain it to get that weight and that head pressure off of the top of that liner. So when you get water on top of there, all the cracks then continue to leak through and that just causes degradation below the surface and we don't want that to happen to the pond. So that's what we're trying to correct there. Um, any questions on that one, commissioners? And then I want to point out right below that the basketball court, which we've talked about a couple of times, um, we've been waiting to get quotes back um, for two options. And once we have those back, we'll be setting up that on-site meeting here in the next month or so, or the next couple of weeks, hopefully, to get the community our partners with uh, uh, Uptown, then the, the board out to check that out and kind of pick which site is best for us. Cool. Director, as we discussed, I'm going to skip to the memorandum of understanding, unless Commissioners have any questions on any of the end project focuses that we're working towards design, which would be that current division focus section. No. Okay, um, this memorandum of understanding, is not really a memorandum of understanding, it's a partnership with DOTE. They are working to repair the Victory Parkway Bridge, which is over Kemper Lane on the Twin Lakes end of Eden Park. So that's where they're starting. They're actually going four or five blocks above that with a intersection. Uh, redo. So as a part of this, their project extends all the way into Eden Park, all the way past the Crone to Martin Drive. And they, we've talked about the pre preliminary alignment with them for six months now, but we're at the point where I have something to show you all just to show you what potentially would change. This is a ODOT DOTE funded project. It's not going to cost us. Certainly we're not going to pay for the vast majority of all of these things that are happening, but we may have some adjacent things that we would want to do in this timeline. In any case, the major points to make here are, as you're looking there on the screen, you see Martin Drive. The dotted dashed area to the right of the intersection shows you a diet to that, essentially realigning that right turn, making that intersection much more safe for pedestrians. As you can see there in the intersection now, you have right angles to bring people across the street instead of that kind of unknown how it sits right now. So there, currently there's those bollards there. There are bollards. Other kind of, but just the kind of the cheap version. Yeah. This is going to be the, the professional version. That's correct. This will this will um, essentially solidify and make permanent the the bollards pretty much in the same location. They're almost in exactly the same location. You can see that it makes the parking a lot safer with that bump out around the corner there on Eden Drive, mm -hmm. headed out of the park. So that's the main takeaway from that top cross section that you see there. Also, though, that'll be a three way stop now. Which Absolutely, is a huge safety. Mm -hmm. Yes, slow traffic down tremendously. It's a fun road to drive on, but it's also one that people can get busy looking around and enjoy the scenery. So that's going to be a, a three-way stop, which will also really improve safety there in Springside. So on the right of that picture there, you see the raised crosswalk. That's going to be also a huge amenity there, um, promoting safety from crossing the road right in front of the crone. That's what that intersection shows. That's what that cross section shows. And I've been talking to the DOTE folks. I sit in meetings with them every other week talking about this stuff, even potentially putting um, some more calming devices before and after that pedestrian access. People fly down there, and that's a very dangerous area, especially as Mark continues to do more and more awesome programming there. Getting so many new patrons there, I want to make sure that that's as safe as possible. So that's towards that. straight across the street um, from the walkway into the and the levee clock on the other side. Yes, there... yes that is okay. the levee clock. That's correct. Okay. That little, that is yeah. correct. Okay. So how does this relate to the Kemper Bridge? I mean, this isn't over the Kemper Bridge. That's correct. It's just extension. They're going both ways, four or five intersections. So the bridge is the driving factor for ODOT, but the funding includes five or six intersections beyond that mm -hmm. on Victory Parkway itself and all the way down to Martin Drive as a part of their 
intersection. They they put that in for the quotes like that and for the for the grants like that. So so we've been talking to Reiner Reising and Joe Conway from DOTE. I set up meetings with those guys and we've been kind of helping to craft this so that we both get, you know, the most advantageous things for the parks while they're doing it anyway. And Joe, during this pro project, will there be a point in time where total traffic will be stopped in front of the crown? That's a great question, Commissioner. Um, that is possible when they're redoing the bridge. That is absolutely possible that that exit will be taken away and the bridge certainly will have days where it's down to one lane. I'm not quite sure what they're doing yet. I know the concrete railings are a big, big issue with this. Many of them are spalled and cracked to the point where they're unsafe. And there's some definite structural issues down below because I know Garrett and I are meeting next week to talk about how the crane is going to sit down on Kemper Lane and what they're going to do to move those off and on. So I'll have a better idea of how much that's going to be closed after those meetings. And we move forward. I've been in preliminary meetings, just walking the corridor with ODOT as they were talking towards funding and we're helping those guys as they need it, um, even apply for more funding for some of these things. So During it's gonna, what year is this project going to happen? Uh, slated for 26, 27. Um, that could also be some time to do some things to the crone. We're, we're talking with them specifically this started on our end because of the Mellon Arch Bridge. And I'd come to you all several months ago saying that we had some stones that were moving and you dealt with that before I know. This would have been a great opportunity and will be a great opportunity to do that. And DOTE has already helped us by showing us the bedrock behind those walls, negating some of the things we would have had to do. So that $1.5 million project that we brought to you may only be 200 feet of that wall at a quarter of a million dollars, but it will still be the most advantageous time to put it in. Yeah. So they're helping us. They're showing us things we don't even know in the parks that we have. So it's becoming a good relationship and that one's going to be a great project. What's really exciting about this too is there's going to be a net parking Absolutely, yes. So on that, currently there's parking on the crone side, but on the other side, there's no parking at all. And as you can right. see these, those bump outs are going to be parking on both sides. So up towards the Mellon Arch Bridge, we're going to lose a little bit of parking, but it wasn't really official parking anyway. So this yeah. kind of spillover that people would park there. Nobody said anything. Yeah. That would become a firm curb and a, curb and a firm sidewalk through there. So when we lose a couple of those like flex spaces, we're going to gain so much more space on the other side that it's really going to up our capacity at Crown, um, which Mark's super excited about because you know he knows that folks are are driving around looking and then yep. thinking that this is going to open up a lot more space. And so yep, exactly. great. Jason's exactly right. You essentially lose seven or eight, five of them unofficial spots, and you might gain. Um, 35 spots. So for a net probably of somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 new spots total all on that side of the road and 750 feet that didn't have parking before. So that will also help to calm that because the lanes will be, you know, more like they should be now. You won't get people running 55 miles past the crow and that drives me nuts every single time I see it. So many of the things. Direction. Yes, ma'am. More than enough for a white knee road. Deal. Yes. <laughs> All of the positives that they're doing here, um, all of the things that they're proposing here, I, I believe as a transportation engineer to be positive. Great. Um, Tia, do you want to go to the next page so I can give them an overview towards the bridge? So there again continues the part they were talking about, and now you're up to essentially the bridge at the bottom of the screen there where I've got that aerial overlaid on there. The very right of that aerial is the bridge, the Victory Parkway Bridge. So you can see Another major component of this is as that road runs through right now, um, they are going to road diet and take away that piece of road that uh, connects at that Y angle right there. That will go completely away. And only the only the curved piece that runs back into Eden Park slash Victory Parkway right there will remain. That will make that intersection and the pedestrian traffic there infinitely safer than it is right now. Currently, you have to look back, whether you're a pedestrian or a car, to hit that. So. So the DOT is proposing that, and I, I believe in concept and what they're giving us here. What they're asking is you, you do lose three driveway accesses there, as you can see shown in the top of that. Yep, exactly to you. So those three right there will be served by what they're proposing will be more of a blacktop, um, non-curb, but still stormwater efficient um, driveway. And the DOTE is asking that we as parks take care of that under maintenance that portion right there. Um, we we park there now along that road to take care of the green spaces that you see. We gain green space in this situation because that roadway goes away and will be restored. Um, we'll park there to utilize that when we do things in the summer anyway, and we're already taking care of Twin Lakes. And in preliminary conversations with Jenny and Dave Boutel, I don't know that that's gonna be an issue from a 
operational standpoint, but wanted to make you all aware that that's the ask. That's probably the biggest ask in this project from a park standpoint. So I've got a question. If you're coming from Crone towards the bridge. Yes. Can you turn left at that new curved? Yes, sir. Okay. You can. Okay. Instead of veering left. Instead across, of veering. That's it. You have to up in to a 90. That's right. And, much safer. and you see a crosswalk right in front of it, Commissioner. Yep. That's another calming measure right there. So, yes, you can turn left right there and go back, essentially back 10 degrees. And the, on, road, and the road going up towards St. James, that curves, um, that's going to remain open or no? Yes, I think St. James is a corner. St. James, this one. That yeah. yes, that is open. Yes, sir. That stays open. That will have that will be the end of that driveway. Yes, and it will be um, not curb, but that's the blacktop extension, exactly like I was talking about. That will be the piece that the DOTE maintain asked us to maintain. They're going to put in and do all the work for that. That is the piece we would be responsible for snow removal up to the right of way. Okay. But coming from from the bridge towards Crown. Are you still going to be able to turn up towards the, wa the water tower? At the intersection that's shown at the end of that Y, that will be open, yes. The okay. only thing that goes away is the Y intersection there. Coming that way. Yes, sir. Okay, gotcha. Yes, you will still, the road that's right beyond that, that's a 93 yeah. right now, that one, no change to that whatsoever. Cool. And they certainly have many, they have five or six more intersections up Victory Parkway that they're doing things with, but I... Certainly didn't include that. Just wanted to show you all the things that involve the parks. So those are the big, big disruption, but that's going to be just an incredible improvement to that whole roadway there. And eventually, when we have an MOU to approve, it'll have all this stuff kind of laid out. That'll be what we bring back to you yeah. guys in the next, I guess, later this year. More yeah. that. This is essentially the first alignment that I've seen from the DOTE that was cooked enough to show you all so that you could see what's going on. So we're bringing this to you preliminarily just so you're aware of the project. We'll, we'll report back as we have more things. Thank you. Yeah, very welcome. We next up is current initiatives, right? Yep. Okay, so just a couple things on current initiatives. Matt is still working on the digitization since you all approved in December us to be working towards that. He's talked to one of the most exciting things is he's talked to the Greater Cincinnati Public Library who has scanner like nobody in the country that apparently is a pain in the butt to maintain and we don't want to buy and we don't want to touch with a million foot pole. So they have offered to partner with us to digitize a whole lot of this stuff. Um, right. It's still in its infancy, but some of it, if it could be public record, which probably is everything that doesn't have utilities on it, they can do at a very reduced, if not free cost under the city. The things that we have to protect from a utility standpoint, gas lines, water mains, Greater Cincinnati Water Works doesn't let just anybody have those plans. You know, we don't want anybody yeah. to be able to terrorize our system. So, so some of those things, electric are under lock and key. Those we will have to pay for. Matt is working to negotiate a price for that, but it will be infinitely cheaper than some of the things we told you about three or four months ago. But right. this doesn't negate the partnerships with MSD. It just augments them. Essentially, we'll have those digitized by the library, and then that digitization will be ready for MSD. So none of that. Right. We're doing the same thing and only doing it once, but we'll have it even more ready for when those folks go to digitize other things for us. So that was at no cost for the library. No, ma'am. Some of it will be at a cost. The ones that we, the ones I believe the way it is that are public record that they could share with people, like re renderings of alt and things like that. We can. Those would be free, if not very reduced cost. Um, the ones that we can't share, the utility drawings and things like that, that we need for MSD, I think it's 15 bucks a sheet, which is less than what we had budgeted before. We're working through account, but essentially, if you think we had 750 to 1,000 sheets, we're way, way less than a half a million bucks, like we told you on those things. So working through some of those details, we'll come back with a plan as we uh, finalize some of these MOUs and e uh, CFS and ETS, not CFS, ETS finalizes their MOU for the overarching dig digitization that we wanted to piggyback on. We'll come back to you when we know exactly what's going on with those. Yet again, the library is the best. Yeah, is the best. It's, it's a win for everyone. If yeah. we can do that, they're close to us. We can take drawings down there at our leisure. We have people that understand white glove policy for drawings that are 150 years old that we don't want to tear up. We're going to work with the UC 
Mr. Getz, as you talked about, to try to ensure that we have a continuity between the 1970s, the last time this was done, and now to bring all that together for one history of the park. So okay. got the right people in place to do it, and we're working towards it right now. Um, commissioners, um, the reason that you don't have the, the trackers this time is essentially because of me. We are working through those. We're doing a whole lot of work inside of the project tracker this month. Jason has hard copies of pretty much everything right now for your viewing. But it's uh, about 20 pages, and it's almost every project. It is every project that we have, essentially, by funding code. There are certainly some formatting things to take care of before it's ready, but we're at the point. Jason, you can speak more to this if you want, but we're certainly at the point where we can tailor this to be exactly like what you want it to speak. Um, Just if anybody wants to look at them, they're to, to be reviewed. One of the things we've been trying one, to One set? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So the first four are essentially what you've seen from me before, which is the completed projects, the uh, board approved projects, the in progress projects, and the consideration projects. That essentially this time, instead of giving you a pivot table, that is the actual project tracker. We just collapsed everything except the financial information. All of the comments inside of board approved and um, in progress are up to date so that if you wanted any information on that project of what's happening right now, there's two or three sentences that tell you anything and everything you want to know on all of that. Um, it's to the point, it's Matt and I have talked many, many times about this, how to make it interactive and easy for you all to digest because as Molly's looking right now, there's just so much information on there that if, if we could show you how to utilize the tool, it may be easier to just give you that and access to those things. So I believe the director is going to try to set up some meetings so that a couple of you can come down and view this. And um, so one of the things we've been trying to figure out is how best to show this, right? Joel's been presenting those tables since I've been here, um, and they provide a snapshot. Last time we got into a bunch of kind of detailed questions, and as a lot of complex spreadsheets do, it, it becomes more difficult to explain it quickly once you start to do that. And so they've added a lot of additional lines here in order to flush out kind of the information that's available. Uh, I think we're at a point now where it's, it's time to, we can, for anybody that's interested, we can set up kind of an individual meeting to go down, kind of see it all. I mean, ultimately, it is less of a tool to report on the than it is a tool for the people that need to answer questions to go to answer them very quickly, um, which is what makes it so great. Um, you know, I don't spend a lot of time looking at it during the week because I know I can call up Joel and Matt and they can give an answer in one second. So I think we're at a point now where, it, you know, at your convenience, we're happy to have that meeting. We got a TV even bigger than this at Joel's shop. We can put it up on there. They still like to show it in tiny font to prove that I need bigger, <laughs> better glasses than I have. But uh, we're at a point where we can just do that walkthrough and kind of let folks answer any questions possible and really see the, the uh, how the sausage is made, if you will, or how, how all these things are being tracked at a much more specific and high level. So really exciting. This is amazing. If, if yet, yeah, still a little confusing to me. <laughs> but I want to get the nomenclature right for you all, too, so you know what exactly like what Commissioner North asked us last time. How much money do you have left? Well, it's a great question if you don't know that. So this one, at least, we have so far pivot tabled to by fund, but there's several different ways we could present that information that can happen in the snap of a finger, but we certainly want to know what your preferences are. So we're happy to accommodate that. Just please let us know when you want to see it. What kind of technology are you all using to project manage? Are you using a project or what kind of? I use, right now we use Microsoft Planner for our day-to-day -day individual projects. We're building that system and capability as well. But this is all built in Excel specifically because CFS is in Excel. And that's kind of the whole point of this. We're pulling VLOOKUPs from several different places within CFS. Matt is doing all that stuff. Craig is helping certainly do that. Ensuring that we're pulling, instead of typing in numbers that could be wrong here, we don't exactly like what we said, it lives in CFS. That is the numbers that we're pulling. And we want the brain, we want the project tracker to only be populated by things that we are one version of the truth checking from CFS. That has kind of been well, the holdup. I think what you're talking about is more along the lines of how many dollars have we approved and where does it stand in the process? But I'm thinking, you know, this level of project management may warrant a system to help you manage projects. I bring this up because the state of Ohio does have a really awesome program where you can take the training and then be reimbursed for it. We use it. I mean, it's a program that's available to everyone. State of Ohio thinking that technology training is really important. Absolutely. Um, and it's, you know, a day's worth of training in Microsoft Project is, you know, it can be expensive if you've got 
a dozen or so people being trained on project management. So it's just something to think about because if we get into this realization like, wow, you guys really are managing scores <laughs> of projects. You know, then it gets to the next level. How are you actually pulling off project management and keeps space moving along efficiently? Planner is the there's differences. I know this, but we are using planner kind of as the first people to do it. So every project that you see here or the 50 that we're actually working on, you know, that has everything. Those 50 have a bucket inside of Teams. Teams, we've integrated all that stuff into Microsoft Planner. And Planner allows us to make a bucket essentially for each project. And inside of that bucket has task, task lists and it lets me assign to any of my team with deadlines and calendars, essentially all of those things. We can show you that too. It's less complete than the project tracker, but both of those things, that's kind of been what I've been working on as Matt's been working on the, tr the tracker as I've been working on the that planner. But yes, it does integrate with uh, Microsoft Project as well, Molly, to give you ant charts and things. So we're looking towards that too. I'm not familiar with Microsoft Planner. It sounds like it's, it's kind of new. It was yep. Microsoft. Yes, the things that project doesn't do as far as, you know, critical path and things like that. Planner is more human based and team based as far as assignments and calendars versus assignment and calendar of critical path. If that makes any sense, it's more managed. It's more uh, focused on managing people than project elements. So we're trying to use teams in that capacity. To the extent you get to the point that you want to take on some training, yeah. just recognize there's a reimbursement resource out there. That's we, I will absolutely. I will absolutely take it. I'm sure a couple guys in my shop will want to take it too. Thank you very much for that. We'll get into it quickly. Don't. Yes, ma'am. This will be available to the public. As much as the commissioners tell me that they want available to the public, it's a whole lot of information as we're showing you right now. And please read some of those comments because it tells us, I mean, I'm very cautious that it's going to be a public document when we're writing those things, but it absolutely has intimate details of some of the things we have going on right now. You could you could be able to look at Lytle Park and know exactly what's going on with it right now. We just moved Dave. It's all public records, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. that's and right. The question is, is how could we turn it into something that is public exactly access, which are useful? Yeah, and again, this is a multi-year project, right? Sure. What they've done even this quickly to get it to this point is amazing. And yeah. Each month it's growing and getting more refined and more sophisticated. And then the question just is, is how can we continue to uh, take that step from being a computer program that you need Joel and Matt to explain walk sure. through to something that is intuitive for people to, to access. Somehow. Yeah, and I'm, I don't know, there are probably people out there who wanna get into all the details on that. But the kinds of things I was thinking about is, I'm in a neighborhood. I see something in, in the park, or I know that there's a project going on in the park, and I just want an update on it. Yes, ma'am. Is there a way to do that very easily? Commissioner, we can make that report just the thing that you asked me the question on. If you say you want to know everything that's going on in MLK right now, in 30 seconds, I can make that report only the 10 things that's going on in MLK and the prioritization of those things. That's that's the beauty of it. If you, When you all come down, we'll show you that. Ask us some questions and just see We'll put that specific report for you together. And that was the point of kind of going back through this and making it all automated and work with actual systems like CFS is so that we could give you real time information. And it's not just things that we have to go back and verify. These are things that we are be look uping and pulling from the system that governs our, you know, finances. It allows us to be responsive to those inquiries much quicker. Sure. Yeah. Because it's That's all great. At, you know, just search level. That's amazing. Thank you. I I believe that is all I have, Mr. Commissioners. Anything for me? Just to thank you. Thank you all. You're very welcome. Yes. Thank you. Very much. Uh, okay. It's, uh, it's a, out of order by a page, only because the, the thing that we're going to the action item is on the back of Joel's report. Okay. And since Derek's report was inlaid, it is just the bottom of the page. So we can flip the page. Derek's report, which is just the next page over here. Page number. It's uh, 27, no, 25. You're right around there. You go back to the side, uh, yeah. There it is. I got it. Yeah. Might not be on my package. Yeah, exactly. I just get out of it? Uh, yeah, I put them on <laughs> within a page or two of where that's at. Morning, Derek. Good morning, Pacers. <laughs> morning. <laughs> you need one more telephone there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
So uh, it's kind of like last uh, commission. I pretty much have an update of vacant positions. We're now like down to about 15. We have about six additional requisitions that's gonna be in. So this number will go up once that hits our TO. Uh, I think the key changes in part-time recruitment, you'll see that by this time, March 15th of last year, yep. um, we have doubled. So we have a 98% increase in the amount of municipal workers. It is a little bit slower on the increase with recreation specialists. I'm not sure why, but um, those positions that we are having a little bit less um, traction with, the CB team are, is uh, putting additional information, just encouraging people to apply and letting them know that we have those vacancies. But uh, we are moving fast. We have about 50 part-timers that are within the hiring process, getting employee health screenings and doing new hire uh, paperwork. So I'm meeting like 15 people downtown right after this meeting. So we're, we're onboarding them pretty quickly. It's really encouraging how many more applications we've got. As you can see last year, 169 applications. And then already we're at 342, which is just tremendous as far as being able to fill those positions. That was one of the things I heard right away last year when I started was that we just had very little success in filling part-time positions over the summer. Even the ones we did fill, the, the time they were with us, which really strained the whole department. So mm -hmm. it's really exciting that we're getting that much more traction and hopefully filling those spots with some good folks. Do you know what you attribute that to anything in particular? There's probably some macro economic things that are going on there, uh, but also our team's done a really great job. I mean, I think everybody missed their part-time folks last year, their seasonal help. And so we've had, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we've got um, the yard signs that are in almost every park all around everywhere I go. There's yes. a yard sign even in areas that I'm still learning your art. I'm like, oh, it must be ours because there's a yard sign there. <laughs> Um, so I think that's how um, Rox team, which I didn't know from last one, um, is the third best social media engagement in the country. Uh, we get a, lot of, a lot of people out there. And we also attended a couple job fairs. So when we were at the Neighborhood Summit on uh, last Saturday, there were folks that were, there was the Mayor's Jobs Fair. It was happening at the Duke Energy Center. We went to, a, uh, I think, a job fair at UC and a couple other spots. So we've been trying to put a renewed effort on it. Great. Yeah, we're working hard to like streamline the onboarding process because currently those part-timers, they have to go downtown do and pay out of pocket uh, background checks and um, driver's abstract. We uh, The city has onboarded, onboarded Verify First, in which we can do that in-house and we can ID bill and pay for that ourselves. So that way we won't lose people within that shuffle as well. So hopefully we can retain a lot of those 50 applicants that we have because we do lose them because they got snatched up to another job pretty quickly. Um grant writer position that you guys are asking about. We have a requisition in. So uh, I've gotten all the information I needed to get that going. Um, I'm working with Central HR. Once that requisition is approved within two to three weeks, we'll post. I'll, I know you guys wanted that posting to see what that's gonna look like. It's gonna have questions. So just to let you know, it will be, uh, it won't be like grant writer. It'll be um, senior administrative specialist and it'll be a grant writer kind of parenthetical. Uh, but we'll have like supplemental questions that kind of digs into the type of candidate we want and we can kind of shuffle through those. Great. Um, so we're moving and we'll have it posted for about a month. So make sure Does we have, that go up? Uh, hopefully in about three weeks. Uh, once it's, as soon as it's approved by um, civil service by next meeting, hopefully you guys will see the posting. Anybody watching at home needs to be polishing their resume. Um, <laughs> because it will be up soon. Great. Great job. Really exciting. Um, so that's why I have those key updates at the bottom because we're doing like uh, I've been working with natural resources on that Arbor series, those tree workers, um, where we that's the one that's been like a year on going. And we're finally at the step where we meet with the unions and it'll go to city council. Uh, so you'll, we'll now have an entry level, which we train those tree workers to get those certifications they need. And hopefully we'll expand our applicant pool to allow for like youth to work uh, students to uh, qualify to apply and also some of our part timers. Our rec specs, we don't have a direct path into full-time city employment to transition to that position. So I'm really excited about that. Right. Historically, we can have like three, four applicants, or you might have six people take the test and four people drop out as soon as they start climbing a tree. Yeah, I'm not doing that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Before you had to start at knowing a lot about trees, now we're in with this intro series, we're going to be able to take if you're a laborer for parks or anywhere in the city, or if you're a um, florist, or anybody that's interested in this work come into that entry level spot and then there's this path to get up to um much more and, and they'll be trained by us so it's much more of a path to like learn a real skill and kind of um, that's great their, 
that should help retention as well if you get somebody that you can train up and mm -hmm. yeah that's great Derek this was a this was a new position that was created that's, yeah that's why it's taking so long. so long to mm -hmm. go through the process the get, yes yeah that's why I didn't want to do with the grant writer. We've got to do three hearings, and they're all one to two months apart. Wow. No, I'm kidding, but yeah. that's probably true. No, I bet you're not far off. Yeah, I don't think you're. <laughs> you guys have any questions for me? No, it's just a great job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this report will become a little bit more extensive. Every commission has to be add uh, more information just to give you an update on what we're doing overall in HR, because there is a lot more things that we're working on. And you're getting help for your for your department. Yes, we have three individuals. Well, actually, there's five now that we're interviewing within the next week. Great. So. I have a question for you, Derek. I was reading an article about how many um, postings have requirements that are actually not necessary to perform a job. And so it keeps companies from being able to hire because mm -hmm. they're saying we need a bachelor's degree when mm -hmm. you don't need a bachelor's degree to do some of these functions of the job. We're missing a lot of the labor availability through this. How do you think the roles that we have available meet up to that statement? Well, I think the city has done a good job with adding in some of those like admin tech clerk classification where it says experience may be, uh, be able to replace some of those uh, degrees or they'll drop it down from a full degree to 35 credit hours and two years of experience. So that some of those people who have not gotten a degree but have done some schooling and enhanced their education can qualify. So they are working to kind of broaden that because we need people. Yeah. Uh, so it just it's, it takes some time because you know you have to have equity across all the classifications. When you make one change, you have to consider other comparable classifications. But I think I do think they're doing a good job in that area and making it a little bit more broad. It's smart too to kind of streamline the uh, application process. <laughs> like make it cost the money and make it quick, you know, because yep. that's what everybody else is doing. That's my goal, and, yep. it, and it is working. We're getting them in pretty quickly. Good. Very good. Now, so well, thank you, Derek. Thank you. Thank, no, you. thank you. Hey, Director, you've got uh, some action items for us. Correct. Uh, so next up is the allocation for uh, some additional funds for our train removal. Uh, Effectively, because of the Arbor series not getting filled last year, and us only having um, one tree crew for parks, we've been using contract services in order to take care of that. Last year, we allocated $100,000 for this emergency tree removal. These are trees that are in danger of falling. We have to focus on the edges of parks that are near roads or sidewalks or trails within the parks. Um, I think Gary Diano um, and the team are doing a great job of identifying those and getting folks out to take care of them. Um, and th but they've been burning through those contract dollars because we don't have our own internal teams. So that only has about $24,000 left to get us to the end of the year. So they've come and asked us for an additional $60,000 allocation to make sure we're continuing to take down any emergency trees. Um, Greg, the balance for, so, so it comes from the Conservation Land Management Fund 428, which is a fund where we take in dollars for trees that folks take down on city property, correct? That is correct within city property and the fund balance currently is about $490,000. And so that's fund balance that we didn't allocate any funds out of that in the budget. So it's it's expected spend for this year was zero. It was just going to sit as a $490,000 fund and we're re uh, requesting to be able to use 60,000 of those dollars um, to augment this until we get those Arbor series finished and then high, which hopefully will be um, by the end of this fiscal year. Any questions? I, I think we've done a great job around the city of um, getting trees down and, and Crystal and her group uh, seeing hazardous trees or branches of trees. I mean, it's it's noticeable how, how great a job we're doing with that. Any other questions for this? I'll entertain a motion then for approval of the recommendation. So moved. And second, thank you. Roll call. Yes. Yes. Is that did you just say Castellini? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. 
And stay then, right there. Right? Stay right yeah. there. Next up is the operating budget. So the operating budget, um, you guys have been through this before, but I'll give a quick overview. Um, the part we're at in the process is that we, um, Parks makes a recommendation to the city to enter the city's process. And at that point, the city has a review team um, in the budget and finance departments um, and the city manager's office that will review all of these, um, our budget proposals and decide what the city manager's recommended budget will be. Then that recommended budget will come out sometime usually in May, then it goes to the mayor. The mayor then gives time to make changes to the budget um, and recommendations or additions or subtractions before the mayor presents it to city council. That then usually leads to the month of June, which is city council debates, um, city manager's budget makes any changes they want to have, and then that gets finalized um, by the end of June. Um, at that point, we then do the all funds budget, which is where we'll come back with their recommendation and we'll present kind of an all funds budget, which uses the commissioner's funds as well, to plan out what does our fiscal year 2024 look like. This is effectively kind of the first bite of the apple for us. Um, this process started basically when I started having my first meetings and Jenny was introducing me to folks around the city and I was saying, what do you guys need? I'm here to help, what do you need? Um, obviously everybody needs a lot of stuff, but we whittled it down kind of through that process with each division. And then we had um, individual meetings starting in January with each division, Craig, where we kind of went over what the recommendations were, what the staffing was, what some of our options were. And then that eventually led to this budget proposal here which is the first two pages are kind of the overall budget, and then we'll go through the fixed items. So I'll let Craig review kind of the overall budget recommendation for the city's process, and then I'll get into one of the exceptions and kind of what we're, what we're trying to do for next year. Okay, and when we go through the uh, pages, the first part, this is without exceptions. So obviously when you add the exceptions in, that's gonna increase the value of the budget. So overall, the city budget for fiscal year 23, these are the city funds, was 21,816, 21,816,000. Yeah, a little bit higher than that. And our recommended budget without the exceptions is 22,265,000. This is primarily just be dri being driven by the uh, cost of living adjustments within the city's budget. The city uh, FTE amount uh, for us was 228.4. The recommended budget is 228.7. We did not make any adjustments. That's just what was in the city's file. So they gave us a quarter of FTE. So we'll, we'll live with that. And that's effectively what they send over to us as our start. This was your budget last year. Here's what we're starting to add for next year. So for the general fund, and that's the highest dollar fund within the city's budget, last year's budget was 9.6 million. And the general fund target is uh, this year, is 10.2 million. That's a $552,000 increase. And that increase is due to cost of living adjustment and a significant increase in our auto and fleet expenditures. So if you recall last year with the high gas, gas prices, we're kind of going through this and the auto fleet and that really didn't adjust. Well, they did make adjustments to their charges this year at the fleet services. So that is reflected in this higher amount that increased by $100,000. Those are dollars provided to us by the city. We do not uh, manipulate those dollars at all. Then going to the restricted funds. On the restricted funds, and I do apologize, I don't believe attachment B was in your packet. That was my fault. I passed it over to Tia, but that is now in your packet. Uh, the restricted fund uh, budget for fiscal 23 was 12,191,000. The requested uh, budget for fiscal year 24 is 12 million, one, nearly 100,000. It's a decrease of 100,000. That is primarily because we uh, double counted a budgetary item in the waterfront budget, Sawyer Point 318. We had professional services, but also for $100,000, but also we had $100,000 in ground maintenance services uh, and a combination of that and security. So that's why you see a reduction. You don't necessarily see a significant increase in the cost of living or inflation within the restricted funds. And that's primarily because we try to house all of our staffing in the general fund. And by doing that, that allows our general budget to increase with the city's target. And if we would target those individuals within those restricted funds, then you would see a negative impact on ourselves. Cause that's one thing that we worked on trying to get most of our staff 
into those except for fund 332 or 792. And then the infrastructure fund, the income tax infrastructure fund 302, this is a city fund, similar to the general fund, but a smaller amount. Uh, the budget is in fiscal year 23 was 1,866,000. In fiscal 24, our target was 1,921,000. It's primarily COLA. We did, we were asked to do a budget reduction exercise for this fund. This is something that's very common, go year over year. We didn't have to do one for the general fund, but they did ask one for this uh, fund. And that was a reduction amount of 288,000. Similar to last year, what we focus on is potential vacancies that we see in that fund. So on average, we can main, we maintain about a two open positions in that fund. So our commitment that we're requesting is like, you know what, we'll maintain two open positions in that fund in hopes that we're just through natural attrition, that'll occur and that equated to 150,000. Then the other part of that would be a substantial impact to parks is the removal of the part-time associates. And that would be a $133,000 impact almost 134,000. And this will definitely impact the East and West regions primarily. And our hope is since the city is still using the ARP dollars that they'll just go ahead and just reimburse through there versus taking these reductions. And that's something what they did last year. We did the same reduction exercise last year with this fund, but at the end, they never took those exercises. They never, um, recommended any of them. Well, this is another example of if they, if this does become part of the city manager's recommended budget, this would be something that, um, you know, we'd be talking to city council and trying to find additional resources to try to replace this because this would have a severe impact on our park system as any funny cut would, but um, people would notice this because we'd be, we'd be trying to make the case with city council that this is an item that's really worth it as they kind of look at the bigger picture. Yeah. And the next part is the exceptions. So, Jason? So, um, like I said, these are the pieces we went through and kind of developed this plan and how to, how to fund it. Um, big picture, there's about $2 million of increases here, 2.1, and about 1.1 of that is due to the urban forestry increase. So that has to do with taking the um, rate from 0.21 cents or from 21 cents to 31 cents, um, and then that's going to, we're finally going to receive that funding this year. Um, having voted on it last year, that'll start coming in in July, and that'll allow us to expand that budget as we proposed in the past. So that's the biggest part, portion of it. The next group of it is about um, several items that we're going to go through here in a second. Um, and then that will mostly come from um, our, uh, from various of our restricted funds, about $440,000. About $190,000 of it will come from reimbursing from capital projects. Um, 50,000 of it will come from this fund 428, which we just talked about a second ago, which is the urban or the conservation and land management fund for tree services. And then um, about 300,000 of it are our are, are requests for additional general fund dollars. And, and Jason, before you get into the details, so the increase in the urban forestry, mm -hmm. in my mind, when we get a target from the city, I would have expected that they would have already rolled that into the target. So mm -hmm. in essence, we're asking them to give us what they're going to be getting. Correct. Okay. So, um, and, this, and this has to get into the kind of minutia of how the process works, which okay. is the city, while we focus on, or Craig focuses on several dozen line items, they're focusing on thousands. Yeah. And so there's a process where I think some of these things are automatic and then they start to get whittled down as we work our way through this process. Gotcha. So our expectation is, is that our hope is, is that all of these things that we provide a funding source for um, should be relatively non-controversial and, and get added pretty quickly. Okay. And then um, the $300,000 of increased general fund dollars, we feel is like a modest ask as we're looking to expand services to our parks. Um, and so we're hoping to make the case at the city manager level and then make the case at the council level if need be that that's a, a good um, use of our funds. So first of all, the urban forestry assessment, um, this will add out the plan that, that Crystal developed and that the team developed a year ago. Um, we'll be adding equipment. We'll be adding some arborist teams or some tree crew teams as we get these new arborist series in. We don't necessarily anticipate that being um, right away as June hits because we have to get that additional equipment in, which, as we know, there's been a, much, a long wait time for some of these tree trucks and some of these specialty equipment. But we do have that in here so we can hire them when need be. 
and there will also be an increase in our contract services for um, street trees. So next up is um, what we're titling equity and park maintenance across neighborhoods. This is a subject that comes up a lot um, and it's easy to see, right? When you go to when you go to certain parks, they historically had beautiful plantings, beautiful flowers. It's kind of like the standard for that park. When you go to other parks, the standard is just different. It's, it's, it's much simpler. So what we're asking for is two florists and two laborers. That would be one each in the East District and one each in the West District, which would allow those two districts to uh, or two regions to increase the quality and the and the work that's done there. And what we anticipate is, is that would lead to additional flower beds, additional plantings, additional mowings, additional track pickup and litter pickup, which allows us to just maintain that higher level um, and respond to things much quicker. So we're paying for that out of um, these various funds, 330, 430, um, and 332, and also by um, cutting our um, part-time fund a little bit. Um, so that we are able to use those for full-time people that are year, around year round. We're doing it again. So equity and park maintenance two is the one that's not funded. So we don't have a fund source to this, but we're making the case to city council that um, again, if we could add two floors and two laborers um, to each district, that it will allow us to be that much more responsive. So that's the case that we're making. That that's going to really increase the quality of life for citizens across the city. So Jason, this is total of four of each of these, right? Correct. Each in east and west we pay for, and one for each in east and west we're requesting yes. um, additional support. Yeah. Next up is Crone Conservatory. Uh, we're going to add a florist to Crone. Crone is just doing amazing things. Um, I was going to get to it in the in the director's comments, but the Bunnies, Bunnies and Bloom show set a record. They brought in four hundred thousand dollars for that show. The previous record for a spring show was one hundred twenty thousand. Oh so God. just it's unbelievable. Um, so unbelief, right? Um, and so they're already getting geared up for the March 25th launch of the Butterfly Show, which is going to be really exciting. And we just, we, we, what we've seen is this continual increase in traffic through there. It's just really exciting. So, Did you say like, March 25th? Or the I believe so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They're efficient over there. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it was that early. Yep. March 25th through June 18th. Okay. Yeah, the spring show is over, and it doesn't yet feel like spring to me. But that's how that's how it's labeled. But 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 Bunnies and Blooms was incredibly successful. And we're going to add this this florist, uh, and this florist will work both a crone and a board of nursery. Our hope is is that by adding this florist, we're going to increase our production, which will then allow us to decrease our purchasing of um, various horticultural from other suppliers. So we're hoping that this will be part of kind of a gradual change over to doing more in-house production and allowing these shows to, to be more successful. Next up is the Business District Flower Pot Program. Um, so this is another one where we're gonna ask for a little bit of funding from the general fund. Uh, the way this works is that years ago, the city said the Flower Pot Program will be 50-50 between the general fund and communities. And, um, and then we had this many communities subscribe to it, but there's a wait list. There's additional communities that would like to take a part of this program, but the general fund dollars have not increased. So what we're proposing is adding a florist, which will allow us to increase that, um, will allow us to increase that 50-50 split. Additionally, flower pot just costs more than they used to. And so this is going to recognize that. So what we're effectively saying to uh, the city or the administration and council is we need to increase those general fund dollars in order to keep that 50-50 split and to add more neighborhoods that can participate in this program. If they're not interested in that, we could still expand the program, but then the neighborhoods would have to bear that full cost and it loses that 50 50 split um, dynamic. So we think that's a really, again, a really strong case. This is a huge quality of life in that throughout the city. Um, and yet again, an effort to try to provide that equity to the whole city. So it's not just first come, first term. You're the neighborhoods that have been in the program before. So you're the neighborhoods we take care of. Jason, do you have any idea how many of the 52 neighborhoods participate? Um, I do not, and I should have that. Um, I can get that for you. But it's only in the bus business districts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 26. Oh, that's fine. Jason, mm -hmm. how, uh, when was the last time the fund was increased? From the city for the yeah. general fund? It has not been. Since its inception, <laughs> which is how long ago? Probably. I remember talking about flower pots in the, the business sector flower pot program as a potential cut when I was in the mayor's office back in like it's 20 years or something, right? Yeah. Close to it. 
And so, well, it'll receive that like 1% as, as we talked about a second ago, where they give us kind of our guidance for next year. It gets that little cost of living bump without gotcha. real, okay. but it, but it hasn't received again, because of the dynamic of it's 50, 50 split. If that 50% doesn't go up, but yet costs go up, you're never able to expand to more neighborhoods. Yeah, right. So we think for $40,000, that's a pretty reasonable um, ask that again, allows us to serve more neighborhoods, provide that equity and just take into account the fact that, you know, costs oh, are more expensive than it used to be. Exactly. Next up is safer and better maintained trails. Um, so we're going to hire a, we're proposing hiring a trail project manager. We have three different um, kind of large cap funds for trail improvement. Uh, we've got like a million dollars for Mount Airy. We've got $500,000 to do what we're calling the connection trail, which would go effectively from um, Buttercup, or I'm sorry, Parker Woods to Buttercup to La Buedo, to Greeno. Bradford, Belter, Tanglewood, Traxon. That's great. I, I, I'm a, I, am, I am very impressed yes. with that. I was um, and then comes into Mount Airy. And then we've got from the state, we've got 350000 for um, all art to do some trail realignment. So we have all these capital dollars, but we need to have, there's nobody on Crystal's team that can make this happen. They can take this from project to like community engagement, to design, to putting out RFPs for trail construction work, to then eventually like having the trail work done and being able to manage that project. So we're proposing using those dollars to activate that right? the capital project, unlike Lytle Park, where you hire a team and that team goes out and does it, and we have the infrastructure to manage that in Joel's shop, we don't really have that in the trail design. Group. So we're proposing hiring somebody that will then make, basically activate these funds. That makes so much sense to me, especially given the importance to trails and our whole operation, that we would have a dedicated person. Yeah, that. certainly. Exactly. Kind of skills will this will this person really be more of a project manager or will they have any actual trail design or trail experience? So this is where we're hoping to find that sweet spot. So Derek was just talking about um, how you have to pick the city um, basically classification that you want to hire for, which comes or, or wait, and or wait a year to get a new yeah. one. Yeah. And then well, we're hoping to be quicker. Yeah. And then you also want to then try to marry like what candidates apply and what their skill sets are. And so a couple of different things. One is that we're hoping to find kind of the right person that will, I mean, and we assume there's a lot of people that are passionate about trails. So we're hoping to find somebody that has that skill set. And even what we've seen as we have um, Flores on our team that are the head of our invasive species removal and Drew and the head of our trail um, team right now, Greg, both are florists, but they're florists that have special skill sets that allow them to then take on these specialized skills within the park. And that's what we're hoping for here. In addition, I know we've had some conversations with the team that Cora brought in to do the Little Miami Natural Surface Trail Design Plan, um, APR, ATR, um, Advanced Trail Research, I believe is what it is. They um, do some like trail school or trail trainings. And so we've had some preliminary conversations about can we bring them in for a day or two training? Where they might train even silly directors um, how to know more about trail work. And then we can have both our team, the folks that are interested in it, maybe even folks from other partners participate, and then whoever this person is, we want to get them that specialized education as well. So would the funds be more towards new trail or call it rerouting of poorly designed trails that are just, you know, it'll, legacies of old roads that really shouldn't be trails or it'll be a bit of both. Yeah. And so one of the, one of the things we we found is that we have these dollars, right? And there's this kind of vision for, but what we don't have is somebody to answer that exact question. And so uh, you know, Crystal and I are trying to do it, but we've got a lot of stuff going on. What we need is somebody that's actually doing it, bringing it to us for feedback, which we then bring for you to you guys for feedback and allows us to take that next step. And so what we imagine is, is that one of the exciting things is that like Tri-State Trails is also working on a similar um, hard service trail that like shared use trail that would follow that kind of same path that we're talking about from um, Solway Park right down by Spring Grove Village kind of near that friches there up through an abandoned um, rail line that would then connect it to College Hill. Well, all of these parks we're talking about kind of follow that. And so we're talking about how we can integrate that in and have um, true connectivity to where you might Get to the trailhead and it's like you know here you go now you can come in here and, and, it, and the it's signage can be integrated and we can have a lot of real so you can have this kind of broad experience of um you know just connecting the city up the the, the trail 
system that connected all the parks that you referenced. Is that a hard surface or is that a natural surface trail? So that's again one of the things that we can talk about is that you know, could it be so tri-state trails is always a hard, hard surface, right? But could we do a natural surface trail that's next to next to it, right? That would you know, what, what could that look like? What's that opportunity? And that's what bringing this person on allows us to explore all that and kind of see what can we do with this. Good. Important. So next up, more events across city neighborhoods. Um, so as we increase events at, at, at all of our parks and as we increase things that are going on, a lot of those events happen in the evening or on the weekends. And we don't have the staff capacity to necessarily take care of that. And when we do, it causes a lot of stress on that team by having to do overtime, having to folks work six, seven days in a row in order to cover that. And so the next two are items that we're going to um, fund ways to uh, support that team so we can have more stuff. So the first one is event coordinator. That'll be what's called a service crew leader. We currently have two of them down at service area coordinator. Um, we have two of them that, that are in Lou's shop on the waterfront that are designing all of our events, doing all the contract services for that, coordinating all that. We want to add someone to that because they also then need to be at the event on the weekend and stuff like that. So this will allow more bandwidth. And then we also want to add a maintenance crew leader. This will be an electrician likely that will be able to set up the electric for all this, test it, make sure it's ready to go. But again, every time you have an event in the park, we have to have electricians go out and respond to that. So we need more capacity there. The great thing is these will be paid for out of the funds that already host all these events. So 318 and 329 are Sawyer Point Fund and the Smale Riverfront Park Fund. 326 and 330 are the uh, funds that we take in for our pavilions and our lodges or for um, kind of other rentals and contract services. Um, and then 332 is current. So anything that kind of supports that or anything that happens in each part can come out of that. And so we're looking to fund these and then hoping that by having these more events, we bring in some additional revenue as well. But most importantly, we just want to have more events at parks, more times for folks to come in and enjoy their parks, be able to give them the proper attention they need. Next up is a GIS analyst. Um, so as we've talked about a lot, Joel's team is doing amazing stuff with building out the type of tracker, with connecting that into our parks planning map. And uh, we're working to then build out a work order system that will be built off of that CAGES map. And currently all that work's being done by Matthew Bonas, who is um, just real lucky to have, because he does all kinds of amazing stuff, including, you know, he did all the groundwork to increase the urban forestry assessment. Um, so we just need some more bandwidth there um, to make sure that he has the support he needs to continue to kind of make this amazing back end stuff that helps us track everything and helps us be on the cutting edge of taking care of everything. Um, so that's that product, that um, position that will be funded out of um, our, um, our our capital projects. And so we'll be able to fund that that way. And then the last one is the hazardous tree removal, which is what we just talked about a second ago for this year. This will be to have a dedicated line item for that out of that 428 fund um, that we're just going to add into the budget and will be part of our budget every year in the future to make sure we have that contract services ready for that. So as I said in the beginning, um, it's a total of about 2.1 million of exceptions. 1.1 is from the urban forestry assessment. About 440,000 are from our funds that um, have been building up over the last couple of years. I think, um, you know, not having a permanent director in place. I think COVID allowed us to have a little bit of decreased spending. And then we've just found different ways to increase revenue and increase contracts that are putting funds into those funds. We'll allow us to support that. About $300,000 is what we're asking for from city council, which is for the flower crop program and the additional laborers and florists. 170,000, which are from capital funds, that's for the GIS analyst and the trail coordinator. And then 50,000 from the 428 urban forestry manager. So, we're incredibly excited about this. I feel like this is kind of a big step in, uh, you know, uh, new park director, uh, seven months on the job, learning about what the, the different needs are in our department and trying to um, support the team as much as we can. We're really excited about what um, this will do for our um, service we provide to the public. So happy to answer any questions. I have four or five questions. Excellent. Let me give them to you. Let me lay them on you and then you can take over. Um, the first question is, can you give get it to me in English? I'm a GIS analyst, meaning I've read what's here. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I really understand what the analyst 
is doing. I know we've talked a lot about Matt DeBona, who's mm -hmm. super great reputation. Mm -hmm. That's definitely someone you want to uh, move on to do other things and mm -hmm. backfill. So he's obviously a learner and wants to continue to grow. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how this is different than the brain, right? Um, hang on, let me get my questions mm -hmm. up because we'll go. I don't want to spend too much time on mm -hmm. that because that could be a 20 minute answer probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> number two, um, these are awesome. Everything that's been listed here, I'm like, yes, we definitely need that. We're obviously not going to get all of them. How does the process work with the city? Do they kind of decide what they like the most and then say, we'll give you somebody for trails, mm -hmm. number two? Um, number three, a lot of these feel like really important priorities that we could potentially talk with the foundation about campaigning around trails, campaigning around flower pods, and I know they've done some of this stuff before, so is there opportunity? What I said, yes, we definitely need this on pretty much everything here, so presuming we won't get it all, which we won't, how do we get it all? And that leads me to the question, kind of what's the process with the division managers and the team to think about, think through, every organization has to say at certain intervals, what can we stop doing? so that we can reprioritize in some areas? And are you, you know, really assessing what can we stop doing to make way for some of these priorities? These are my questions. Gotcha. So we'll start at the, at the end um, because that's something that I hadn't necessarily thought of or talked through, right? Which is that how to reprioritize or how to stop doing things. Um, in most of my conversations with the various departments, they were all feeling like, um, they just needed more capacity to do kind of the core things. Um, and so I guess my, my um, incomplete answer would be like, so that's a great thing to think about. And that's something that um, I'll take back to the team and we'll start considering, which is what are there things we need to deprioritize in order to maintain, maintain make sure that we're focused on the core areas. Um, so not a great answer for that, but yeah, just because- something to think about. I, I appreciate that, right? Um, as far as the GIS analyst, um, on some level, it isn't necessary that Matt's going to move on to other things as much as what we're finding is a lot of success with focusing on GIS and focusing on building out that capacity within parks. And so we feel like we need more bandwidth to make sure we continue to successfully mine that area in order to help the rest of our operation. Um, so one thing that I was surprised about is that we don't have like a maintenance ticket system, right? It's mostly just emails, phone calls, make a list on paper. Um, We've talked a lot about how the project tracker has, is gonna eventually have this really robust preventative maintenance piece, which works into the Brand Center Carroll report and kind of every asset, how long it's like. But one of the things we wanted to build out for that is in the GIS part of it and in the map is an actual ticket system that would allow folks to um, say, for instance, there is a barrier by trail side. This is the problem, it's been, it's been knocked over. We can create a ticket. Instead of just sending an email, hey, it's me to check that out. We can create a ticket. That ticket, then when it's closed out, you know, I mean, everybody's familiar with what a work order system is, but we didn't have one. Um, we looked at contracting out and having one that we, we buy and we have to maintain, but instead there's a way to build it out through the CAGES system. And so we've had some meetings with them about how, how that system will work. Um, we're going to start by building out um, the system through the operations team, and then eventually it will build out to where we'd be able to incorporate urban forestry in that and kind of have everything as part of that. So that's what we need to build that GIS capability for because it's going to allow us to be so much more responsive to citizens and have all of that tracked. Um, so it's just adding that capacity is going to be huge for our ability to grow that piece, which we're really excited for. Um, so let me ask the question about that person. In filling this role, are we also protecting ourselves in terms of um, turnover? I mean, because right now we've got one person who does that. Yep. So this is um, this is protecting. Well, I think it protects us in two ways. One is certainly if um, you know anybody, any of us wins the lottery and are like, <laughs> see you later. Um, you know, we've got to fill that role. And as you guys just found out with the director, sometimes that can take a while to fill. Um, but I think it also protects us against turnover, and that it says this is super valuable. What you're doing is amazing, and we understand how amazing it is, and we want to grow your section. We want to give you somebody to work with to invest in what you're doing, to give you the support you need to continue to be successful, yes. which is another way to protect against that, yeah. which is that 
don't listen, Matt, if you're listening to the meeting. We don't want Matt to leave, right? We want him to stay for a long time, right? So um, by, by investing in that section and investing in it, giving him the tools he needs to make that work, um, you know, we hope that, that we're protecting ourselves in two ways. Yes. So the city process, um, this is my first time through it on this end. I was very aware of the uh, mayor process and then the city council process and had many late nights around Christmas time when we used to be on a calendar year um, of trying to get the budget um, where we would be there till one, two in the morning until everyone finally came to an agreement on what the budget would be. Um, my understanding is, is that the next step for us are two which is that we will submit this to the city's budget process by our board and they will start to look at it and crunch the numbers and um, we'll then have a meeting with that review committee so they've got an internal committee that has folks from the budget evaluation department folks that are from the finance department and folks from the city manager department where we'll come in and they'll ask us questions and it'll be up to us to um, defend that 1.7 million of this should be um, easily accepted because we've we funded it all um, but they might have some hard questions for us. And so Craig and I are already kind of thinking through how do we answer those questions, try to anticipate what those questions are and be ready to defend at least that 1.7. And then in that process, we'll be making the case that the additional 300,000 really has a huge value and should be a win for the city manager and for the administration. And so hopefully we get that included. If that's included, then we could have a very easy May and June. Um, if it's not included, then that's be the part where we can then talk to council about why we think this is important. My understanding is in April, there'll also be a presentation to budget committee of city council. That's more like a 10 minute presentation where it'll be an even shorter version of what I just laid out to you guys, but where will be me explaining kind of, here's our priorities, here's how we're gonna fund it. And me making the first pitch for, we're asking for $300,000 of additional general fund dollars. So that'll all kind of play out these various levels. We're hopeful that the 1.7 will be accepted pretty readily. And then I'll just leave us for the, to make the case for that additional general fund dollars, which are obviously um, hard to come by the city, but we're also kind of making the case that look, we've found a way to increase effectively city parks service to the community by $2 million. We're only asking for 15% of that to come from additional general fund dollars, which we think is a pretty modest request, quite frankly. Um, and honestly, I really expect to have a lot more than the city council to do. But um, when the process all played out, we were able to do 85% of it on our own. So we're hopeful that that's a pretty good case that we're being really respectful and really um, modest in what our request is, but also showing how this is gonna have a huge effect on my only comment to all of this is I kind of feel they'll look at that 300,000 and say, why don't you just go back into the commissioner's fund and cover it? And, um, and so my question to you is if that comes back in that regard, will we perhaps decide to do that? Well, I think the case I'd make to the, the administration and then the city council is, is that we are going into our own funds quite a bit. And again, this gets back to that 85% of it is funded by other funds outside of the general fund. And, you know, Parks is blessed that we have that, but, but we also need to make sure that we are, you know, fair to Parks like we're fair to all the rest of the departments. And so if we're adding $2 million for the service, but only requesting an additional 15% of that of 300000 to the general fund, we're hoping that makes the case that we already have dipped into the funds that are available to us in a big way in order to try to increase our service to the public. Um, so again, that'll be part of the case we make. And I think you're right. They might say that to us. Um, and I guess we'll see how, how good I am at making the case that, uh, that we are have dipped in more funds and we're, we're doing our best for citizens. Jason, uh, I think along Molly's line is a question as well on priority. The circumstance where they say, or if the budget department would say, we're gonna give you the GIS position, but we're not gonna give you the, the flower pop program mm -hmm. and adding a person there. Should, should we not be able to say, well, if you're gonna give us 100,000 there, we wanted to go here mm -hmm. instead. And I know you've prioritized these and I know the GIS is number eight out of 10 from a priority standpoint. But do we have the opportunity after the, the budget office has gone through and basically picked and chose mm -hmm. which exceptions to accept? Can we then say, okay, you've agreed to 200,000, 
but rather than going here, we want to go back and put it to our number one versus the number eight. Absolutely. And Greg, correct me if I'm misspeaking, but my understanding is, is that that would be part of our meetings with them when we have these meetings with this review committee, is that we'll be able to talk through kind of what we think is important. And then additionally, when we pass the all funds budget in July, is that another opportunity for us to, or, or just through the normal city budget process? I mean, even, even right now, if we were to, like, if we were to say right now that we need to hire this GIS analyst and we want to take some big money that's dedicated to vacant positions, we can move that around as it sits, right? So this is how the budget's approved, but then we can always uh, make the case to finance to move that money around to different priorities throughout the year, right? Yeah, during, during our conversations and meetings with budget, budget valuation and finance, we do have the opportunity of, from a priority standpoint, the commissioners believe the um, GIS analyst should move up or down or the green space. We do have that opportunity to speak with them and may reprioritize what, how we feel the, the, they should rank. And so, well, and then, so, it, so additionally, when I said earlier, this is kind of our first bite of the apple. Then beyond that, currently, we're optimistic that we're going to get that 1.7 approved because we funded it. So the two that I think from a priority standpoint are the most important to think about are the general fund dollars, right? And we've ranked the additional laborers and florists as higher than the flower pot program. But since it's only the two things yeah. and, yeah. you know, the, the values are 250 for one and 40,000 for the other, um, that's kind of where we're at as far as what we think will be kind of scrutinized more. Yeah. But, but we can definitely, I mean, again, if in September we want to change up how we do stuff, we always have the ability to move dollars around. And as long as we're paying for it, we have the ability to move dollars around within our budget. <clears throat> just the authority that you guys have as the board commissioners. That's what I, I was just trying to make sure I was following you because every time we do this, it feels like it's new to me. Um, so when we put together the budget request, we're requesting a number. Mm -hmm. And these are examples of how that those dollars would be spent. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, we're requesting that they add these line items to the Yes, right. And so that number is, um, is produced by summing up all of that. So, but then once we get our final number, the park board still has the ability to move budgets around yeah. throughout the year to adjust to change in priorities. And so um, if they were to, if the city manager were to approve a budget that we, we felt like we had different priorities for. Once the budget's approved, we will always have the ability to go back in and move things around and to change it to fund, um, to get changing priorities or changing conditions um, throughout the, just throughout the year. Okay. Okay. So it's not locking us in to say, this is, these dollars are exactly for this thing. Correct. It's, it's just a pool yeah. of money. We've already <laughs> expressed the priorities but we have the flexibility to adjust those mm -hmm. as needed on the back end. Yep. So when you put together like a personal budget, you might have yep. a line item for internet, line item <clears> for <throat> cable, line item for your Apple, your Apple TV, and then you get that approved. That's how you kind of come up with what am I spending on right. X for the year. But then throughout the year, you might be like, well, Paramount Plus is having a good shows on right now. So I'm going to redirect that into HBO minutes or whatever. Yep. And you can move that around throughout the year. This is just the process coming up with what do we need for the year? What are we projecting we yep. want to do? That's helpful. Thank you. I, I think it's worth saying, though, if we're putting it in like this, this is our intent. Absolutely. You know, we absolutely want to be accountable and we don't want to do a switch or put something in that we have no intention of. This is indeed how we would want mm -hmm. to spend the money that we're asking for. And we all learn the process as we, yeah. as we move through it. But my guess is, is if the budget office was like, here's what we think we can do. Um, if we wanted to request that to be changed before the city manager's budget, I, I would imagine we were gonna have a lot of disability. They're not gonna be like, surprise, this is what we did funded you at. Um, it's gonna be more of a collaborative process, especially for these dollars that we're funding out of our restricted funds. Well, I would just echo that, yeah, I don't think the 300,000 is asking too much considering the overall scope of the budget. And I would, I would hope they would recognize that and actually fund the whole thing. A couple of questions I have is on the urban forestry, will that replace by, by uh, enhancing our, our equipment and our staff, will that offset some contract work that, that you know, um, 
we're currently experiencing, right? So, so there is some offset there. So there's a, that's not just all increased uh, expense. In year one of this new increase, um, with the plan is to have mostly increased contract work because we don't have the equipment. I know we're not, yeah. And then as we transition into year two, the hope is to decrease that. So, so to start off, we're going to increase our contract use a lot because we want to get to more trees. We want to service more trees. We want to inspect more trees, keep trees safer, plant more trees. And then in, and then that will change. We'll decrease the amount of contract service we need to increase. As, the as, as this crew develops. Correct. Yep. Okay. So this is year one of what we hope is as a multi-year right. plan to make our urban forests and our, our street trees that much better and, and Communities that much better. So the, the other question I had, 428, how is that funded? That is funded through the sale of uh, trees on our properties. Through the sale of trees? Well, yeah, the, if a tree gets cut down, uh, whomever cut it down, such as like, say, Duke Energy, we receive funding for that. Okay. But, but that's that's if if they need uh, you know a clear path for you know their their lines. MSD would be another it, example. Okay, so if they take a tree from us, mm -hmm. we get funded for that yeah. tree, and that's what populates that. Fund. Yes. Okay. And I think to emphasize what Jason said on an FTE basis, this does reflect where for urban forestry year one only addition of one person, but year two. 2825 we're looking at nine so overall that's where that shift yeah. will be from contract to mm -hmm. our own FTEs. Mm -hmm. let me ask you a question about the the flower pots one of the motive well driving that is the city's desire to be responsive for if they decide they don't want to do that do we need do we need the, the extra um, personnel on our end? Or do we need it anyway to meet the demand that exists already? We can use it to meet the demand already. Um, however, um, we're proposing what that benefit will be, right? So it's always difficult to go and say, we want to do the exact same thing. We need more money to do it. Yeah, um, sure. So currently we're just, you know, Crystal's team is for the green space team and team is just at their, you know, they're doing the best they can and hustling. And so um, this is an opportunity to say, not just we need more to do the same, but we can do more if we have more resources and it'll allow us to um, cover more neighborhoods um, and, yeah. and, and, and meet the kind of increased demand already. Yeah, there's there's not a there's not a part of parks that isn't like they could use another person, um, and so um, that's that's been consistent with all of the meetings with folks. Because even even if we get all this, we're not we're not great. We're not sure. like perfect. Now every park's done, and people are getting off at two thirty and taking a lot of other breaks. Like we're still hustling to get everything done and to do a great job. And so long term, you know, uh, we'll always be looking for opportunities to to uh, make the case that park funding needs more funding and that you know, the service we provide is worth that. Jason. So commissioners, I think as we've got this presented to us, we've got- Jason, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, commissioner. I just want to ask one question. How do you discuss the importance of these pots? To me, on the right on the surface, it looks like something that they could cut out altogether. And- so how do you discuss why we need these pots and the importance of them, what it does for these urban city areas? Well, one of the great things I, about- I just, want, I just want you prepared to discuss the importance of it. Absolutely. I sense what the importance is, but I'd like you to tell me how you're gonna discuss that. Absolutely, so um, one, of the, one of the great things about making the case for our city parks and the things we do is that a lot of it can be done just with simple photos. And so I think, I think that's how I would make the case is to be like, look at what this neighborhood has, how great it is. Look at this business district that doesn't have this, how, how much it would be improved by that. And I think it's a pretty easy case to make. I think in addition, um, and I know this from my days in the mayor's office, a lot of our programs in the business district are incredibly popular. Uh, the folks that participate in uh, community councils, the folks that participate in efforts to beautify their communities, uh, the business owners in these small businesses, Absolutely love it. And I think that 
knowing that we've got neighborhoods that are on the wait list, I think that's uh, folks that we would activate and help try to make the case that this is something that we should be expanded, not contracted. So that's how I kind of, to, to start to make the case. And the other piece is, is that um, with increasing costs, we don't want to change this from a 50-50 split to a 70-30 split where the community is having to take that burden off. We want to continue to kind of live up to that same promise of a 50-50 split between the general fund and the communities. Great. You may want to uh, do some uh, uh, photoshopping of some neighborhoods. Here we are today, mm -hmm. and here's a, here's a view of this with, call it proposed mm -hmm. flower yes. pots to really give them a, uh, a direct uh, before and after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very convincing. I bet uh, can help us with that very well. The other, uh, and, and this is, I think, just something that we, we may want to consider. This is not really related to the budget, but it, I see the reference to the uh, Randstetter, whatever mm -hmm. fund, uh, as a $60 million um, uh, deferred maintenance uh, issue. In all reality, it's not $60 million anymore. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure it's, it benefits us to continue to speak in pre inflation mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, yeah. 2018, 2019 dollars. If it's, if it's really closer to $90 million, I think it might be, you know, and I don't know what the, what the increase is, but I know everything costs mm -hmm. a heck of a lot more today, mm -hmm. a la Lytle Park and other mm -hmm. things that we're seeing. So, you know, maybe just something to, yeah. to consider. Yeah. yeah. So as I consider the budget or I'm looking at what's being asked, I think there's two primary things that we should consider as we consider approval or not is the actual items that we're asking for exceptions are being increased and then also the source of those funding. So I think we've now gone through each of these and we've said uh, either yes or no, these are important. I think we've all realized that what the, the staff has come up with are, are good considerations and good things that, to be asking for. Uh, I also think that what has been presented where a million dollars of this is coming from increased taxes that will be there anyway. Uh, are we comfortable as a board then saying, okay, city, we want you to to increase your funding by the $300,000 and we will make up the difference, which is closer to the $700,000 then. Those are the two things that I see. My personal opinion is I think we've done a great job of identifying where we can best use some additional funds and the benefits that the city will get and the, the more efficient that the parks will be. And then number two, um, I think to, to Brad's comments earlier, I think a $300,000 ask of the city for the 050 account, the general fund, I think is reasonable, especially because we are saying, okay, for that 300, we're going to put in an additional $400,000 or whatever it comes out to. Um, I think that's, that's reasonable. And I think from my perspective, as long as we think that that's sustainable coming out of our, our um, restricted funds, which I believe it is, uh, I think it's a good way to approach these needs. Any other questions for, for Craig or staff or comments on? No, I would just echo, I think the, the process looks good and your choices, I think you've you have all have chosen well. Well, then we have a recommendation from staff to approve this to be submitted to the city. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. We have a motion to approve the recommended budget. And will you call the roll for us, please, Tina? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. And thank, I know this is a huge, huge process. And thank you for, for going through it and how well it's been presented. Thank you. Okay, two more uh, action items. Uh, Commission uh, Director, um, you want to take these? So first, I will invite uh, Deputy Director Mobley to talk about uh, this funding request from uh, the foundation. Well, I certainly don't think this will take as long as uh, the budget. So I 
before Joel was here, you were just up here all the time. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I was. <laughs> and so, you know, as, yes, absolutely. I will take it. And uh, I have to say, you know, I do not feel the need to have to sit in the seat. <laughs> okay, if I do. Um, so, as you know, um, we have been working on the Carter's Grove project for a, a bit now, and we are ready to execute phase two, which is installing the um, plantings, um, taking care of the trees that are installed. I believe there are 33 trees. They're doing 30 shrubs and uh, additional plantings around the area, as well as installing the benches and uh, getting the bird feeders in this area in order to make it a bird sanctuary as it was originally intended. So with that, uh, we are requesting the permission to apply and accept $40,000 from the Cincinnati Parks Foundation uh, due to the generous donation from Lee and Shannon Carter who made their donation to the foundation. And we are asking now to move to phase two and spend these dollars. Perfect, any questions? Yes. Again, I'll echo, we fully agree that that's great, great gift from the Carters. Um, do I have a motion to? I just have one question. Sure. This um, also maintains the initial year. I'm sure that so everything can be insured of getting a grasp. And that is correct. What kind of ongoing maintenance do you anticipate annually? This is $19,000 for the first year. I presume that's greater than it will be in continuing years. Yeah, uh, yes, this is greater than it will be because it is uh, maintaining uh, 33 of those trees and helping them get established. After those trees have been established, obviously that can, <clears throat> excuse me, move towards uh, more of a staffing maintenance level because it wouldn't have the need to water in those trees um, on a weekly, monthly with the water bags, I guess it's more monthly uh, to make sure that those are filled. And then once the perennials and the shrubs get established as well, then it will go into more of a maintenance. Um, I know you're asking whether we are going to continue with that contract in order to help maintain or if we will do that in staffing. And I think a lot of that may determine on whether we are able to get some of these budget requests that we have. If um, we are uh, not able to uh, continue with our staffing due to our capacity, then uh, we would be looking to do more of a contractual, um, but I don't, it would not be at this $19,000 uh, price. It would certainly be less. In addition, this gift from the Carters has a $100,000 endowment, so that'll kick off about $3,500 a year. That will go down. Excuse me, Jason, would you yes. repeat what you just said? Because I could not yeah, I hear. apologize. My microphone's far away. Um, the gift from the Carters has an additional $100,000 endowment. That will kick off about $3,500 a year. Um, obviously, that doesn't support this contract, but it will help support the horticultural supplies um, some of the time of a, of a florist to take care of this area. And so we're really excited about that ongoing support from the foundation. Perfect. That's awesome. Perfect. Great. Answer Any other good. questions? Not uh, entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Move in second. Tia, please. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Castellini? Yes. Commissioner Lindner? Yes. Commissioner Lloyd? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And again, just our note from the commissioners of uh, our gratitude to the Carters for this gift, this ongoing gift. You're here. Right. Um, next one, Jason. Next up is a wood recovery grant. Um, and so, um, as you know, we have this biochar project that we're incredibly excited about. Um, in fact, Jenny, Joel, Crystal, and I got a chance to drive eight hours out to Missouri and eight hours back in a two-day period to see a biochar facility um, in full operation. It was unbelievable. Um, I think inspiring for all of us and, and, and led us all with a lot more confidence with this um, project and a lot more confidence with this new kind of technology. Um, so now we're trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to make it super successful. Um, we've currently got 1.1 million towards the project and the RFP has gone out. Um, so we'll be receiving submissions from folks. One of the ways we, we did the RFP was we tiered out the different levels of 
thing. So we need a, uh, the pyrolysis unit. We need the feeder bed that will feed the wood chips into it. We need the um, bed that we will chip the, the wood chips into it. I will store them and each one of those will be a component. But then in addition, uh, these things put off like 1400 degrees of heat. If we can capture that and turn that back into energy, we can power not only the facility that the bio part will be in, but potentially the rest of the operations facility at Yale Road. So that would be a boiler and an energy recovery unit that would be an additional expense. And so we're in um, fine money anywhere and everywhere because we think this project has just an incredible ability to have a real impact We've talked about it all since. So um, Crystal and her team found this um, grant from the U.S. Department of Agricultural, $41 million worth of available resources. Uh, we'd like to apply for at least $600,000, but potentially even more, um, depending on how our site design goes for Field Road, uh, in order to supplement the, the funding that the commissioners have already put in. So we have about $400,000 of Commissioner money that is in this, and then we've got 300,000 from Great Parks and 400,000 from um, the Bloomberg grant that we received. And so we're just trying to grow that pot in order to build out the biggest and best facility we can. So, yeah, questions. Um, what you saw is that what y'all would set like a brand that you would be looking to purchase? Potentially. Uh, okay. So we will. You know, as we go through this RP process, we'll see who responds with equipment. Um, do they do they sell the whole thing as a unit, or you know, you mentioned three call it basic components of that. So is is are they all connected, or one manufacturer sells everything, or can you a la carte it across three? The analysis unit is one unit, and that is what actually does the, the cooker cooking of the wood chips. And then there's equipment that goes to service that. And so one of the things we're asking for in this RFP is what other equipment do we need? How much does that equipment cost? Are there other ways to design it that, that might have cost savings? What are the uh, pros and cons of that? What are the losses or what are the gains by investing that additional funding? Um, and so we saw one configuration of it on this um, farm. Um, and they were also had like big logs. They're really doing some tree work as well out in Missouri. Uh, but we'll obviously then take that in and decide what we want. Can we can we source some of that on our own? Do we need to buy, for instance, the wood chipper from the same people we buy the paralysis unit from? We've asked them for a price, but we also might just go out and buy the wood chipper on our own. And so that'll all be part of that calculation. Um, but what we know is we want to um, make sure that we have the resources to um, build the biggest, the best facility we can to start with. So that's why we're going out to get some of these additional resources in order to supplement the investment we already have or the money we set aside. So you have to chip the wood beforehand, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to some degree, do you, do you look for a uniform product at the end of the process or is it going to be random and then you'll have to have kind of a screening thing that says, I got my big chunks here and I got my dust downstream from that and then the marketing aspect or the utilization of it for you know enhancing the soils and so on is there a Correct. target or a sense of of what we want to have it's to be less than one inch in any diameter okay. the greatest challenge with the machines that have been produced throughout the world has been large chunks of wood getting stuck in the pyrolysis unit. Yeah. So there has to be after it comes out of a wood chipper as you process. You've got to get you, it. That's key. You then. have to grind it out to get it down to the right size. Okay. So there's a wood chipper that chips it, and then you got another step to get it into that more uniform piece, or is the wood chipper the one that gets so it into the turn it on site, fucking down the tree, you know, chipping right there, right? So that's okay. That's that's that's, that's on site. Yeah, gotcha. That means on site that is that would be ground through a, a supplemental grinder to get it down to that down to that okay which then is fed into a hopper that you know, like a walking floor trailer that then feeds it into the pyrolysis unit. gotcha gotcha okay and so what we're proposing here is beyond the pyrolysis unit uh the same manufacturer makes uh an item called a boiler which essentially allows them to recover the heat from the pyrolysis process and then an electric um, generator essentially taking that heat and then turning that into electricity. electricity. Yeah. Okay. And that was not a part of that's an addition to the design that you're requesting yes, this grant for. Yeah. This has come through the discovery process of 
visiting multiple facilities and really getting to know what technology is out there and also really getting to know what our needs are at Deal Road, mm -hmm. both the, the biochar process and the DNR annex. So it, an additional potential revenue source. Yeah, it would essentially make, it has the potential to make the site like carbon negative and and zero energy, like zero energy. So to take the energy from that heating process and then turn it right back into the need that's served right there on site. Yeah. And there's two income streams then with, well, maybe three income streams would be the, the biochar itself, mm -hmm. the energy that this would capture and, mm -hmm. and, and generate, and then the carbon offset and the uh, credits, credits yeah. that, uh, yep. Yeah. This gets better. Mm -hmm. That's our hope. Yeah, my reaction to this is we're asking for uh, another grant that in theory would pay for mm -hmm. this additional uh, capture of the energy. It's hard to find any opposition. Yeah. Right. Is there any sense of, of the, what the carbon offset credits could be? I guess that's all relative to the tonnage that you run through the facility. Currently, I'm working with uh, an international broker for carbon crediting. I want to say the estimation was between 150 to $200 per credit. So, with a, I believe it's like a 20%, um, 20% of that would go to the broker. It's, it's a, that's the next kind of process that we need to do. Would that, that be, we will be back to report on that. Yeah. <laughs> Is that four figures, five figures, or more than that? I believe it could be as much as six, correct? Yeah, so I, I don't want to comment to that yet. Once we identify what the pyrolysis unit that we're going to be utilizing okay. is, that'll conform with the input, output, production amounts can be, which will allow us to formalize that business plan. Okay, and then from from the operator's perspective, you guys have settled with with somebody to to run it to operate it. Yep. Yeah, carbon harvest was our operator that won the RFP for that. One question: Do we have can a time limit? Do we have a timeline on any of this? I mean, I think the faster we can move this forward, the better off we're all going to be. This is really exciting. Absolutely. So the RFP is currently out. And I think there's like a month or so that the RFP submissions have to be in by April. And once they're in, we'll review that. And so we will, I mean, we'll be back to report on this at a regular basis at these meetings mm -hmm. as, we, as we move through that. But our hope is to move it as soon as we can. Much are you in contact with the, and I won't remember the name of the committee, but it's the one that is chaired by Council Member Owens. Are you in regular contact mm -hmm. with that committee? Quite a bit. Yeah. Right up there. Exactly. No. And I've talked to, every time I talk to Council Member Owens, this is one of the things we talk about. Um, and so um, she's incredibly excited about it. And we anticipate that at some point we'll be making a presentation in her committee right. and keep them fully in the loop on it. Right. We're talking to the city's department of um, environment and sustainability, and then also um, that committee. So right. very good. So we have in front of us a recommendation to apply for and accept a grant opportunity. Is there any more discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So move. And a second. Second. And Tia, would you call the roll, please? Yes. 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 Thank you. Director, we're to your updates. I will be comments. Um, we spoke about, spoke about Crone already. Um, just an amazing um, Bunnies and Bloom show. Butterflies of the Meadow will be opening on March 25th and run through June 18th. Um, so that's gonna be exciting. Um, Arbor Day is coming up on April 28th. Um, so we'll have the Arbor Day um, celebration at the Academy for Multilingual Immersion Studies at Roselawn. Um, so there'll be more details about that, but mark your calendars for April 28th. Um, green space, so our team's getting ready to do kind of our first round of plantings for all of the green spaces we take care of, including some flower pots um, that'll be getting ready to happen here in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then I wanted to make sure that I, um, point out that um, this Saturday um, at California Woods, we're having um, waffles in the woods, which I admittedly have never heard of before, but I'm super <laughs> excited for an excuse to go get waffles this Saturday. Um, and I should mention while we talk about that, that um, 
you approved at a previous meeting $300,000 for the armoring where the streams can be taken out underneath the road. We had a um, site visit with um, the naturalist um, Gia at California Woods this week, and Joel is working with um, Adlita, who's the company that's going to perform that work for us, and we'll have an on-site construction meeting here coming up soon. But there is some anticipation that there could be some closure of California Woods because we'll need to shut that road down in order to um, do that armoring to make sure the road is safe for folks. And so we're working with the naturalist to make sure that we try to plan that around the programs that are in place. Um, and then we'll want to make sure we have a real robust communications plan for I mean, both the board, of course, um, city staff and, and the city manager and the council, and then also the community members that are really involved there to make sure we're very clear about when it's open and when it's closed um, and why it's so important to get this done. So that should be coming up, but we'll keep you in the loop on that. Excellent. And that is all I have. Thank you. Oh, then we'll move to commissioner's discussion. Any comments, discussions, issues, items for the good of the parks? We had talked last meeting. You know what I'm going to ask about, right? The boat talk. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, Ginny was in contact with them just recently. We are still waiting on a deck um, of their of their proposal, and we're expecting to get that here soon. And I'll be distributing that to all of the, the board members for further kind of consideration about what are the next steps with that. Okay, so sum that up, we anticipate that um, the winner of the RRFP, mm -hmm. the winning proposal, has got cost increases mm -hmm. and has maybe got some changes in mm -hmm. what they what they, they have thinking. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna see what their proposal is yep. when they come back. And then we're going us. to have some robust negotiations. Or not. Or not. Right. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. So do you think that'll be available? I'll be honest, I thought it was going to be last week. And so okay. hopefully it'll be maybe even this week yet. Okay. Super. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to, again, thank the staff. This was a great presentations today. Uh, very clear and uh, appreciate all the ongoing work and the parks are starting to look beautiful in the spring and nice flowers and uh, colors. So thank you for all your hard work. I'd just like to ask Crystal <clears throat> one question. Crystal, if you take another field trip, can I come? I'm <laughs> 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 Tell her to get or, a or if, if you need some part-time labor for this new uh, biochar system, I think we have someone that might be interested in- Oh, this really uh, excites me. This really excites me. You can operate the chipper. <laughs> you can do the chipper. Uh, Commissioner Lindner just appointed you to the chipper uh, team. <laughs> the deal. Thank you. Uh, I, I also want to thank uh, Commissioner uh, Castellini for joining us. I know you're, you're out of town, but thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you to all of you for being here. And with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Yeah. Okay.